Well, good morning. I, uh, I, as I was preparing for this sermon series and this campaign we're doing on Who's Your One, I was really excited when I found that video uh, that was kind of a part of some of those tools that we've been using, uh, not only because of the good story of Troy's life being turned around dramatically by Jesus, which is great news, isn't it? Uh, and also, you know, it's kind of exciting that he was a former NFL football player. He actually played for the Chiefs for several seasons back in the 90s, and it's just kind of neat to, uh, to see someone who is at that kind of level of, uh, of sportsmanship and, and limelight get kind of that kind of thing happen in their life. But I was mostly excited because I personally know Troy. Troy is my friend. And, uh, and some of you uh, probably have met him. He was here a few years ago. He actually stood right here and shared his testimony with us. Do you guys remember that? And uh, see, after leaving the NFL, Troy went on to work for a company that now works with the Free Will Baptist denomination to help work on investments that help build kingdom ministries. And so he came and shared with us about that as well as his testimony. And, uh, and I get to see Troy several times a year just in December. Uh, Brandon and I were at some meetings in Nashville, and one of the first people I ran into there was Troy. And it's just wonderful because he's this real big guy. And, uh, and you kind of start talking to him, and the very first thing he says is, man, I just need some prayer, and I need the Lord's help in some things, and shared some things going on in his family's life, and just asked us to pray with him. And he's just this real, neat, genuine person. Now, I don't know about you, but anytime I've ever met somebody who's even kind of famous, I, I kind of have a little bit of that same thing that happens to me that I shared happens sometimes when I try to share with people about Jesus is that I get a little sweaty palmed and my throat kind of constricts a little bit, right? And, 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 you know, and, and you add to that that Troy's this big guy, right? And so it's a little intimidating, but when you got beyond that exterior, you found this neat, humble man of God. Now, I just want to have you guys just for a second think about who is the most famous person that you've ever personally met. So think about that for a minute. Who is the most famous person that you've personally met? Now, when you get that in your mind, I just want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them who it was. And the other person just act really amazed, right? <clears throat> you guys are, are a lot louder at sharing than first service was, so I'll tell you that. Good job. Give you a couple more seconds. If you didn't let the other person share, let them share. Now, here's the real question for us this morning. Why did you want to meet that person? So whoever it was, whoever that famous person was that you got to meet, why did you want to meet them? You know, maybe it's because something that they did, either you admired it or it inspired you. Maybe a little bit of their story helped you with your story, and you just wanted to let them know that. Like, man, you have impacted my life. Or, or maybe there's something about what they did that, that you wanted to know more about, and you just, man, you've been had this burning question in your mind that when you met them, you're like, I need you to tell me how you did this or give me some tips on how to do this better. Or, or maybe you just wanted a little bit of what they had to rub off on you, right? You're just like, what do you got? Could you just like rub up your on my arm and give me some of that? But whatever it was, we, we went to them because we, wanted, we admired them or we wanted to know a little bit more about them or we wanted to learn from them. Today we're going to be concluding our series on Multiply and we're going to be in the book of Luke chapter 5, if you want to find Luke chapter 5 in your Bible. And as we do that, you know, we've been talking about how God wants to multiply our life, how he wants to multiply our sharing of the gospel, how he wants to multiply us being disciples that make other disciples. And today we're going to talk about how God wants to multiply our vision and our mission and our influence. And as we do that, we're going to look at a bunch of guys who wanted to meet somebody because they thought that that person had something that they could offer them for their life. And so we're going to find that here in Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 17. It says this, On one of those days, while he, he being Jesus, was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem. And the Lord's power to heal was in him. Just then, some men came, carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. They tried to bring him in and set him down before him. Since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him in a stretcher through the roof tiles into the middle of the crowd before Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said, "'Friend, your sins are forgiven.'" Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to think to themselves, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Because who can forgive sins but God alone? And that's an incredible story, isn't it? There's a lot of action and a lot of, 
like risk and a lot of cool things. We're going to unpack those here in a minute. But I want us to first notice this question of these religious leaders. Who is this man? Who is this guy who's standing here teaching and saying that he can forgive sins? Because that's a huge question. It's really a question that's echoed throughout history since that time. It's a question we see a lot in the, in the Gospels. When the disciples saw Jesus doing miracles, like the time that he calmed a storm, they, they asked themselves, who is this man who the wind and the waves obey him? When Jesus was getting ready to talk about the future and what was going to become the church, and he was going to tell Peter he was going to be the rock, what did he ask them? Who do you say I am? When Pilate was trying to figure out what to do with Jesus because the Jewish leaders had brought him to him and they wanted him to be crucified, really that was the question Pilate wrestled with on that day of Jesus' trial. What is truth and who is this man before me? And for all of us, we're going to come to a place in our life, if we haven't already, where we're going to have to really wrestle with that question, who is Jesus? Because that's the only thing that's really going to matter in the end. And so we're going to come back and talk about the answer to that question. But before we do that, I want us to take a closer look at this paralyzed guy and his friends. Because one of the first things we notice about them is that these guys are committed to a mission. They're committed to a mission. Now, mission, we've been talking about that in this series. Mission is, is what, what directs us. It's, it, it gives us uh, the, the tools to understand what it is we're supposed to do. It should drive us. It should define us. It should tell us how to get where we're headed. And every organization, every individual, every business, every church, everything in existence that has humans involved has a mission. Now, in some places, it's a very defined mission statement, and you, they've crafted words, and they've painted it on walls and put it on T-shirts, right? And everybody repeats it every week. Other places, it's just kind of understood. We all know what we're all about, and in some places, we have no idea what it is. But even if you don't know what your mission is, believe me, you have something that drives you every day to do what you do. I don't know if you've noticed this in our culture, but our culture is big on finding a cause to get behind, you know, some sort of, some sort of reason to live and some sort of you know, cross to bear and some sort of fist to wave in the air. And, and just even looking at nonprofits who are doing really good things, the top nonprofits in our world today all are addressing causes. You know, Samaritan's Purse, which is a Christian organization, and we partner with them to do the Operation Christmas Child Boxes. You know, they, are, they have a cause. That they're trying to take hope and help and the message of Jesus to other, other places in the world. Transparent Hands Association, they're trying to get health care and surgeries for people who can't afford it. Feed the Children are trying to feed the children. That's right. That's what they're trying to do, trying to take care of a need for food for people. American Heart Association, they're trying to make sure that our hearts stay ticking, which is a good thing, right? They're researching that. They spend money. They spend time on that. We also see at a local level, don't we? Man, people get really riled up and behind when there's a, a need or a problem or a cause and GoFundMes go out and benefits show up. And man, people want to help when there's a crisis, a cause, and a need. Kind of reminds me of this story I read recently about a, uh, a young lady from the Midwest. Her name was Alexis, and uh, she grew up in church, and she went to college. And when she graduated college, she moved to Washington, D.C. And, and she said one of her top goals in her life at that moment was to do good. And so she went around finding other organizations that she could do good with. But you know what wasn't at the top of her list? It was finding a church. She, she didn't put doing good and having a mission and finding God and finding a church on the same page. And so for us today, as we think about mission, I want us to reflect, does our faith direct our mission? Does our mission come from our belief and our experience and our relationship with God? Now, how many of you in here have a job of some kind, even if it's a, the honeydew kind of a job, right? So is there, who, who here has, everyone, a lot of us have a job, right? So, so, so I want you to kind of think about this in the frame of your job, but, but, but for, for illustration purposes, we're all door handle makers today, all right? <clears throat> so, so we all work in a factory making door handles. And every day we walk into the factory, and as we walk in the factory, there is this old, crusty, dried up, brown, flower bed outside the door. And man, that bothers you. You know, you just look every day, you walk by and you're like, that is terrible. Like, like somebody should do something about that. And so you decide to do something about it. And so what do you do? You go to the garden store and you buy some soil and some fertilizer and some seeds and some tools. And man, you start cultivating this flower bed. And 
man, you put energy into it and time into it and you plant and you do all the things and you water and you watch this thing. And man, things begin to grow and you got these beautiful flowers and plants that start coming up and man, you're taking care of them. And, but then you realize that there's weeds involved. Who has ever grown anything? I know that the weeds come with the things that you want to grow. And, and so you have to start weeding it and you're cultivating it. And pretty soon you're spending three-fourths of your days working on this flower bed. Now your flower bed is awesome. Great flower bed. And people walk by going, man, that's a good flower bed. People are congratulating you, telling you what a good flower bed maker you are. But what's the problem? You're supposed to be making door handles. What do you think is going to happen if you keep spending three-fourths of your day on this flower bed? You're not going to make any more door handles. And you're going to be looking for a new job. Now, was it good to cultivate this flower bed? Sure. Man, flowers are great. I love flowers. I love plants. I love growing things. But that wasn't your mission, was it? That wasn't what your job was. How many of you have an Instagram account? Anybody got an Instagram account? All right, do you guys know what Instagram's mission statement is? Instagram's mission statement is to capture and share the world's moment. How many of you knew that that was their mission? Like, that's what Instagram exists to do, is to capture and share the world's moments. Now, so let's imagine again, That today you go to a birthday party and you're snapping pictures of this birthday party. It's awesome. And you're posting on Instagram because that's a cute pic. And, you know, and you're doing all this stuff and you're hoping to get all sorts of likes and, you know, and shares and all those kind of things. What'd you just do? You just fulfilled Instagram's mission and you didn't even know it, did you? See, if we don't know what our mission is, we're going to wind up fulfilling other people's missions. Now, these guys, they, they had a mission. What was their mission? to get their friend to Jesus because they thought he could help with their physical problem. But what we're going to find out here in just a minute is is that Jesus had a completely different mission for them and for all of us. And if we skip forward in the book of Luke to chapter 19, we're going to find out what Jesus' mission statement is because he tells us. In Luke 19.10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. That's Jesus' mission. That's what he came to do. That's what he did. He came to seek and to save the lost. And as we are followers of Christ and we look at multiplying our lives and we try to figure out what our mission is supposed to be, what was supposed to drive our life, I believe Jesus is asking us to adopt his mission. He's telling us to forget everything else that we think should be driving us and say, this is what our life is supposed to be about. Exactly what he did, seeking and saving the lost. Now, another thing I want us to notice about these guys and their paralyzed friend was that as they came to Jesus, they had an eager anticipation. They had an eager anticipation. We we don't really know exactly what they knew about Jesus at this point. We we knew probably that they knew he was a teacher and they was kind of gaining some popularity. They probably heard that he'd done some miracles. They also knew that he was ticking off the Pharisees, which, I mean, apparently by their actions, they liked that and they were willing to take that risk. But, But I think we don't understand that taking that risk meant that that they might be, be on the outs with the religious community and even be able to worship with their families because of accepting who Jesus was. But whatever it is that they believed about him, it led them to action. It actually led them to do something outlandish. They, they trespassed. They caused property damage. They lowered their paralyzed friend through a roof. Like, they could have dropped him on his head. Like, they took some risks, didn't they? But here's the thing about our mission. It should move us. The good news of Jesus should not only inform my mind, it should transform my heart and propel my feet. It should change what I do. So what are you risking today because you believe in Jesus? What are you eagerly anticipating Jesus to do that only he can do? Are there hearts that need changed in and around your life? Are there circumstances that need overcome? Are there resources that need to be multiplied? How are you expecting Jesus to do things that only he can do in your life? And what is it causing you to do? Which leads us to the next thing about these guys is that they encountered obstacles. You know, we've been challenging you guys since the start of the month to begin identifying, praying for, loving, inviting, and eventually sharing with one person your hope in Jesus. Like identifying one person in your life who doesn't know Jesus that you can love and invite them into your life and begin that process of letting them know who Jesus is and what he wants to do for them. And, and I don't know about you, but, but I've already encountered obstacles. 
right? Like, I mean, we're just a couple weeks into this thing, and there's already, you know, uh, first of all, there's our own excuses, right? Th- those, are, those are the first obstacles sometimes we have to overcome. But then there's also, you know, rejection. And there's also sometimes just circumstances not lining up. And, and, and if you get enough of those obstacles in the way, you know, it can lead us to this place where we start saying, well, maybe I heard that wrong. Or maybe I'm not able to do this. Or maybe God's just shutting that door and I need to look in a different direction. But I want us to notice what happened with these guys. Because they literally came up against a closed door, didn't they? They're like, we got to get into Jesus. There's no way to get into Jesus. So they climbed a building and tore a hole in a roof. If we're sure of our mission, won't we go to any length to accomplish it? If we're absolutely sure that this is what we should be doing, we will go to any length to do it, just like these guys did. I was recently talking with someone. uh, We were talking about the cost of following Jesus, and they said they always have struggled with this because they felt like if they followed Jesus, it might cost them too much, or it might cause something bad to happen in their life. And and as we talk about it, I just shared, you know, the fact is, is that if you follow Jesus, some hard things might happen in your life. It might cost you something. It might cost you some friendships. It might cost you um, your own wants and your own desires. It might, it might end in a, in a challenging way. But if the mission of Jesus is true and the only mission that leads to eternal life, isn't it worth it? You know, I think often about my father and uh, my father-in-law and, and his father. And uh, both of these were men who, um, who really, through their life, didn't want anything to do with Jesus, sometimes would ridicule their, the faith of others who knew Jesus. And yet there was people, my wife and my mother-in-law included, who prayed for those men for decades. Decades. And at the end of both of their lives, there was a moment where their heart softened and they were willing to listen to the gospel. You know, here's the thing. If the mission is to seek and save the lost, then it's worth whatever it takes to keep on that mission. So lastly, these guys also got more than they bargained for. I want you guys to look back with me here in Luke chapter 5, verse 20. Jesus, seeing their faith, said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, what do these guys bring their friend on a stretcher, climb a roof, climb a building, tear a hole in the roof, drop their friend down in front of Jesus? What do they do that for? So that he'd be healed and could walk, right? Like, that's why... They wanted Jesus to heal their paralyzed friend. And Jesus looks at all this and goes, wow, you guys are so committed. This is amazing. Your faith is so great. Friend, your sins are forgiven. I mean, could you imagine like what's going through their mind? They're like, wait a minute. That, that, that wasn't the plan. Like, what is going on here? But again, Jesus wanted to just switch their thinking about what was truly important. Because the very most important thing is that people have their sins forgiven and their relationship with God made right. That's the most important thing. What Walking and all of those things, that, that's secondary. Because the only criteria to get into eternal life is whether or not we've asked Jesus to be our Savior and asked Him to forgive us of our sins. And so He wants to make sure they understand that this is important, but He also does take care of the physical needs. Check this out, verse 21. And then the scribes and the Pharisees begin to think to themselves, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But perceiving their thoughts, Jesus replied to them, why are you thinking this in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. Immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. You know, we can do all sorts of good things, can't we? We can feed hungry people, and shelter the homeless, and care for the sick, and those are good things. But if we miss sharing the hope of salvation through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, we miss the mission. So often we settle for the mundane things and miss the miraculous things that Jesus really wants to do. The greatest miracle in this story is that a sinner's sins were forgiven by God. That's the greatest miracle in this story. And he also got up and walked. You know, Jesus right here in this is giving us and the Pharisees and everyone in all of history the answer for that question, who is this man? And right there in verse 22 
when he says, why are you thinking this in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I tell you, get up and take your stretcher and go home. In that section, you know what Jesus was saying? I want you to know that I'm God. I agree with you. The only person who can forgive sins is God. I am God and I'm forgiven his sins. I want you to know that I have the power and the authority to do that. That's why I'm going to heal this man in front of you. It's the distinction between words and action because Jesus' mission is one of action. As we've been going through this series, we've also been looking at our church's mission statement and talking about how that should drive and and compel us to to what we do with our lives. And, And here's our mission statement. Engaging people to live surrendered lives as constant disciples in kingdom service to Christ our Lord. And so as we've looked through that, we've talked about you know, the salvation aspect of, of, of surrendering our life and letting Christ be the one that forgives us and leads us and changes us. And last week we talked about being constant disciples and how, how we're supposed to be on this pursuit of knowing Jesus better and letting him uh, use us to help others know Jesus better. And today, we're going to talk about what kingdom service means. Kingdom service speaks of our work to expand what God is doing in the world. Jesus often talks about the kingdom of God in the Gospels. And he compares it to things. He compares it to like a fine pearl or a hidden treasure. He compares it to yeast that is a small bit, but it works itself all through the entire batch of dough. He says it's something that's coming, and yet it's already here. And he commands his followers to go out and continue it and share the good news of God's kingdom with the world. That's our mission. And so how do we do that? We do that by serving others so that they will know that Jesus has the power and authority to forgive their sins. That's our call. And so here's the question I want us to begin asking ourselves as we figure out how to be kingdom servants. It's simply this question of looking around ourselves and saying, how do I get involved? You know, at some point... These guys in this story looked at this paralyzed guy and said, how can I get involved? You know, this guy, he's got this terrible situation. He has no way to make a livelihood. He has nobody to take him to the things that he needs. We need to get involved. And they began forming a plan of how to help this guy. In the same way, we need to look around ourselves and look at our neighbors, look at the hurting, look at the lost, Look at those who are desperately needing a miracle in their life and say, how can I get involved to help them find the answer, which is Jesus? You know, here at Calvary Chapel, there's a lot of corporate ways that you can do that. And and man, we love that. We love the impact of that. You know, this past week, we did our monthly food distribution. Uh, This this month, we gave over 300 households food here in our community. And we love that because we get to do that. And we get to do that in Jesus' name. And we get to love people. And we've gotten to pray with people and share hope with people. And, and man, I'm so thankful for all the volunteers who just flock to want to help and be a part of that. And man, that's a great thing. Also love the things that we do with disaster relief. And, you know, just last month, several men were able to go down to Arkansas and help with some of the storm disaster uh, cleanup down there. But you know what we always tell people when we go on those trips? We're not really going to cut trees. We're going to love people in Jesus' name. And sometimes the best thing we can do is sit and listen to people as they talk about the things that are going on in their life. I mean, I love it that we get to do that. And, and, and you know, and we also have a very active missions program, and we're real prayerful as, as, as hopefully the world starts getting a little bit more normal, and we get to hopefully open, travel opens up better, we can get back to our three-year plan, which is one year we go on a mission trip to Panama, the next year we go on a mission trip to another mission church somewhere in the United States, and then one year we do a mission trip right here in Buffalo. And, and we're hoping to get right back on that three-year cycle, uh, hopefully coming up in the next year or so. And we're excited about that because we don't want to just talk about missions. We want to do missions. We want to go and love people in Jesus' name. And so, man, we are excited about that. And if, if you're not plugged into some of those things or, or other ministries, man, we want to hear about that. And we want to help you get plugged in. But here's the thing for us today. Maybe the most important thing we can do this week is to look around and say, are there some neighbor kids who need a ride to church? Is there some elderly people in my life who need help with their errands? Is there a way I can volunteer at school or help coach a sports team so I can just spend some time investing in young people? Or maybe it's getting to know someone who's not like you and inviting them into your life and into your routine and into your home and just loving them in Jesus' name. 
And I think if we do that, if we begin looking around ourselves and asking, how can I get involved? We're going to see countless micro ministries develop as individual followers from our church get involved in the lives of other people with the hope of sharing Christ with them. And, and as we do that, you know, it might change culture, it might change our community, it might change systems, but more importantly, it's going to change lives on an individual level of people who have no hope, finding hope. As we, one person at a time, commit to lovingly serving those around us and facing whatever challenges it takes to share with others the hope we have in Jesus, we will accomplish his mission. You know, we were all once the paralytic, weren't we? We all once were that person who needed help, who needed someone to maybe carry us, we need someone to point us to the right direction, give us the right answers, take us to Jesus. We, we all were that person at one point, in one way or another. And I'm so thankful for the people who did that for me. You know, as we went through this series, I've mentioned several of them. You know, the, the lady that shared the gospel with my mom, uh, Joe Matos, who was the first person to share the gospel with me and began discipling me, John Dreggy, who in college helped me fe- see what it really meant to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, I haven't mentioned really important people like my wife, uh, who took a risk on a punk kid and loved him anyway and helped me through so many things. Uh, people like Doug Earls, who took a risk on a punk kid and invited me to do some ministry here. You know, I'm so thankful for the people who did that for me. Who are the people who did that for you? Because here's the thing. What Jesus is saying is now it's time for you to do that for other people. The Who's Your One campaign doesn't end with this sermon. It really doesn't end at the end of this year because as you love and invite and share with that one person and eventually they come to a point where they understand who Jesus is and they let him save them, now it's your job to disciple them and point them in what to do next. Help them get to a point where they can find their one and do the same thing for them. And then it's time for you to find another one. And that's the process of our mission from generation to generation, isn't it? You know, one of our big, hairy, audacious goals at our church for this coming year is that 100% of us would share our faith with one person once a month. And that may sound like a big goal, but if we do that, this mission is going to get done, isn't it? If 100% of us will share with one person once a month, man, God's going to do amazing things. Now, in this room here today, I know that there's some of us that maybe, maybe you're the person here today that needs a miracle. That you're the person that needs carried. Maybe you're uh, here today and you're just checking this thing out and you still have not answered that question, who is Jesus for yourself? Maybe you're somebody here because somebody you're a one that somebody invited to come sit here today. And we're just so glad you're here. And we just want you to know that we love you and we want to walk with you and help you understand who Jesus is so that he can point you in the right direction. And really the right direction sounds like this is that we recognize at some point in our life that we can't fix our problems on our own, that we need help. Just like that paralyzed guy couldn't fix his own problems. And and a lot of times, unfortunately, our problems are of our own making because we've made choices to to step outside of what was healthy, step outside of what God designed life to be like, and we've walked our own way. And when we start trying to dig ourselves out of that hole, we realize, man, there's no way for me to get out of this hole on my own. But then when we look up, we realize that God and his love and his wisdom, that he made a path for us. And that path looked like his son, Jesus, who came and lived a perfect life, which no one else could do, died a death on a cross, paying for mistakes that he didn't make, and then defeating death by his own power three days later and rising out of the grave so we can have a hope in eternal life. And he says, and I will forgive you of your sins and give you that promise of eternal life if you will admit to me your sin and ask me to forgive you. Now, a lot of times we sum all that up with this little verse in John chapter 3 that sounds like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Anybody ever hear that before? Right? And I want us to just notice the language in that. Because it took one, the one son of God, to do something about all of our needs. That whole world made an opportunity for us to have our relationship restored with God. And then the way that that plays out is us, one at a time, sharing with one other person how to accept that, follow that, and make that our mission. At the end of Luke 5 here, 
that tells us a little bit of the outcome of what happened because of this story. Verse 26 says, Then everyone was astounded, and they were giving glory to God, and they were filled with awe, and they said, We have seen incredible things today. Man, as we go out and adopt the mission of Jesus, and we start loving people one at a time, offering them the answer that is to all of our problems is that Jesus came to die for our sins and offers eternal life. Man, we're going to see astounding things. We're going to be amazed and we're going to glorify God. And so today, this week, as we come out of this series, as we move on in our campaign, I just want to ask you, are you ready to accept Jesus' mission? Would you guys stand with me today?